Hello, and welcome to Real Cheating Story. I could see that she was angry. The look on her face was clearly marked by intense emotion. However, there was something else in her eyes, a flicker that I recognized from my own past. It was a feeling I had experienced not so long ago. If I were to guess, I was in bed with her best friend, and we were both caught up in a moment that had taken an unexpected turn. I had come to realize that Shauna had a certain allure that made her captivating in ways I hadn't anticipated. Shauna was a blonde with a curvy figure, reminiscent of the iconic starlets of the past. She had an undeniable confidence and knew how to express her femininity in an enchanting way. I didn't have to put in much effort to draw Shauna into my world. In fact, once she sensed my interest, it took hardly any time for her to respond with enthusiasm, despite the fact that I was married to her best friend. Then there was Betty, who stood in the doorway of our bedroom. Her initial shock was palpable, quickly giving way to a flush of anger that colored her cheeks. I could sense the emotional turmoil of betrayal in her eyes. In that moment, I knew I had made a significant mistake. Betty turned and walked out, and I heard the front door slam behind her. A few thoughts crossed my mind. First, that Betty had said nothing but stood there glaring. Second, Shauna seemed unfazed by the situation. She continued to engage me, as if our circumstances were inconsequential. Now that I've had a taste of you, I want more, she said playfully. You really caught me off guard when you made your move earlier, but I'm thrilled you did. I've had my eye on you for a while, especially since Betty and you got together. You're such an intriguing person. Do you think Betty will be okay with this? I felt a mix of discomfort and exhilaration. I knew why I was in this situation. Having shared years of marriage with Betty, our relationship had settled into a routine and the excitement had faded. It felt like we were at a crossroads. Just two months prior, I had come home early from work and stumbled upon something that shattered my perception of our lives together. I went out to my car after discovering some unsettling information. I found a wallet belonging to someone else and checked its contents. To my shock, it contained my wife's name, address, and other personal details, including a picture of her and our three kids, along with some sensitive information. Feeling overwhelmed, I drove away and decided to spend the next two hours before returning home at a nearby park. As I sat there, I wrestled with my emotions and tried to figure out what to do. Initially, I felt a surge of anger and contemplated confronting the situation violently, but then I realized that would only lead to more problems for me. I couldn't understand how this could happen, especially since Betty always expressed her love for me every morning as I headed out to work. Until now, I had no reason to doubt her sincerity, but everything felt shattered. My marriage was about to end, and I decided that a little revenge would serve them both right. I knew I could never do much to hurt Betty at least not in the same way she had just hurt me. Even though I still loved her, I realized I could never live with her after this. Their words burned in my mind. So, did you ever expect us to be so good together? Betty had said. Oh no, Sam. You're so perfect. I mean that too. Everything about you is perfect. I wish I had met you before. I really do. We could have had a great time all these years. Yeah, well... I was married right out of high school and then started working for my wife's father, so that would never have happened. But like you, I wish we'd met a long time ago. You're a wonderful person. You know that? I love Jim, but he doesn't connect with me like you do. I just hope we never get caught. Jim would probably be upset, but he'd fail to confront you, of course. Then I'd have to explain everything, and that would be a huge hassle. After all, I don't love you anyway. I just enjoy being with you. Their words were indelibly etched into my heart. How long had they been doing this? I didn't know, but I knew it had been too long already. He was taller and more athletic than I was, but I think Betty would have been shocked and surprised to find out that he would have been the one facing consequences. I had been in the service, and she knew that, but she didn't know about my boxing days. I kept that from most people since I had seriously injured Billy that day. He was still struggling with the aftermath, and I wanted to forget what I had done in that ring. I had been young and feeling invincible, just like Billy. During an exhibition match, he had been talking to me between punches, teasing me about my girlfriend and how he would take her out that night after beating me. It had been friendly banter meant to irritate a buddy, but I had missed the friendly nature of it. I let my anger take over 
and began to hit him without mercy before the referee could step in. After the fight, he was taken to the hospital, unconscious, and they couldn't bring him out of it for a week. He never fully recovered and had to relearn everything. I had taken away Billy and left a five-year-old child in a grown man's body. I quit boxing after that, feeling immense guilt. I even sent some money to his bank account occasionally to help his family, who thought I was a good person. I didn't though. I felt like a failure. I carried that burden with me, knowing that I was dangerous. I was far more dangerous than the average person and definitely not one to provoke. Now I sat there in the park, wanting to hurt two people, but knowing I could never go through with it without ruining my life. So, I came up with an alternative plan. One that was just as twisted as what Betty and Sam had done to me. I started planning my response, and today was part of my revenge. I can't say I am proud of it all, but I do feel somewhat vindicated. I knew I wouldn't sleep well for a while, but at least I thought I would feel a bit better. Shauna left about an hour after Betty caught us together. Shauna kept complimenting me, saying I was attractive. After seeing Sam, I realized I had a reason not to understand Betty's words about how charming he was. Later that evening, Betty came to the house with her sister in tow and gathered her things. I never said a word, and Betty acted like I should have been begging for forgiveness. I didn't, and I think that hurt her more than anything. Why would you do that to Betty? How could you do that with Shauna of all people? I don't understand you at all anymore, Jim, her sister asked. Try asking Betty about Sam, then come back and ask me that again. If Betty tells you the truth about Sam, call it what you want. I feel quite good about how things have turned out. I hope that Betty understands what this means. What are you talking about? Asked Betty. Are you really her sister, Susan? You don't know her very well. I found out about her two months ago and have had a hard time keeping control. Just ask Betty all about Sam and remind her that it takes two to tango. Once one partner starts that dance, you can't expect the other in the marriage not to react. Are you saying that Betty cheated on you? I have it on tape several recordings, as a matter of fact. I also have them in my mind from the first time I saw them. Yes, Betty cheated on me. She started this mess, and now I am finishing it. She can have her lover, and I hope they both regret their choices. After they left, I made the call I had been dreading. The truth came out, and I needed to contact Sam's wife before he could spin things in his favor regarding what was about to become public knowledge. After seeing them together that day, I had figured out my course of action. Part of that plan was to get even and let Betty experience the same painful realization I had felt. I wanted her to understand the intense hurt of discovery, the same raw, festering wound in my heart. Part of my plan involved documenting the two of them together, which wasn't too hard. They met three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, just after lunch, and they always did it in our bedroom. I wasn't sure how long it had been going on, but it had lasted long enough to show me that our whole marriage was a facade. I set up a camcorder with a timer and captured everything digitally. Each time I downloaded the footage to my computer, I felt sick. It took all my willpower to go undercover like this, as I was constantly battling the urge to confront both of them. I also moved money around and adjusted other financial matters. After calling Sam's wife and promising her copies of what I had on film, I made another call to my bank. I found out that Betty had just discovered the changes and had unleashed her frustration on the poor bank employee. I felt bad that innocent people had to be involved in such a messy situation, but I had no way to insulate some parts of my plan while moving so quickly. I was alone for the rest of the week and actually didn't mind it much considering what had transpired. Susan called one day, wanting to set up a time to talk. I was hesitant because I thought she might try to push Betty back into my life, which I couldn't allow. I still loved her, but that love was fading. What Betty had done to our marriage was too much for me to bear. I didn't know how it happened, and I didn't care. What mattered was that she had betrayed me. My revenge had been harsh, but nothing compared to what her sister would put her through once the truth came out. Betty turned out to be foolish. I'm sorry, Jim, she said. I never expected to hear that from you, I replied. She had the best man in the world and ruined everything with that affair. I hope you never take her back. That would serve her right, Susan said. I hope your hopes come true. Because I filed. I also gave copies of everything I had to her lover's wife. So I imagine he'll be suffering right now too. 
Shauna? Why her, of all people? Because she was part of my plan and lived nearby. Once she understood my reasons, she insisted on being the one I was with when Betty found out about the affair. I always thought they were friends. Me too. Guess not, though. Maybe Betty is as superficial as Shauna, and I just never noticed. Shauna told me she had always wanted me, so knowing that made the situation a bit easier. Remind me never to cross you, Jim. By the way, my only other option was to confront them physically. I've been there before and never want to return. It still haunts me. Haunts you? You've been there before? Never mind. It's water under the bridge now, and I won't discuss it. My thoughts drifted back to that day in the ring so long ago. I wish I could have seen the look on her face when she discovered us together. She was furious. Why, Jim? Why are you being so nice all of a sudden? Why aren't you defending your sister? She is family after all. First of all, I was always a bit jealous of Betty when she met you, Jim. I always had a crush on you. Secondly, she had, as I said, the best man in the world. Yet she couldn't be happy with just you. I can't understand what she was thinking. Well, that's something I can't understand either, but for very different reasons. You could have left her some money, you know? Mom and Dad were furious with you until I found out what she had been doing with Sam. Once I told them, things changed quickly. Dad wanted to kick her out immediately, but Mom managed to stop that, barely. I thought for a moment that Dad was going to kick Mom out with her. It was a close call. Did you know that Mom and Dad had a similar situation early in their marriage? Nope. Oh yeah. Dad caught Mom being unfaithful, and he went berserk. He confronted her partner, and nearly hurt him badly. He kicked Mom out for a while, but eventually took her back. Many were surprised their marriage survived. But the other couple didn't fare as well. They divorced rather quickly. Wow. I never knew that. I guess Dad was thinking like mother, like daughter. He was even a bit upset with me for a while, but he got over it. It's a wonder Betty didn't think of that before she strayed. We talked some more, but I wanted to finish up and get back home since Betty wasn't there. I had been left with cleaning tasks that I had taken for granted when I had been so happily married. However, Susan seemed eager to talk, and it took me a while to realize that she was trying to express a different kind of interest in me. I shut her down as soon as I sensed that. Susan, why are you talking to me like I'm someone special to you all of a sudden? Look, Jim, just because Betty decided to throw away your marriage doesn't mean that I don't find you attractive and want to get to know you better. Well, honestly, Sue, I'm not interested in starting anything right now. My fling with Shauna was just to show Betty what it felt like to be betrayed. I'll admit it had some excitement, but I found that I can't engage in anything like that again, at least not until everything with Betty is settled. I'm just not that type of person. Will you give me a chance? I don't know, Sue. Honestly, I don't know. Maybe, but don't hold your breath. I might end up moving somewhere else. This whole situation has messed with my head pretty badly. She left feeling a little wiser and a little sadder. I thought she was a nice-looking lady, and any man would be lucky to have her, but I had a dilemma since her sister was too close for comfort. I had been married to Betty until everything went wrong and now I want a distance from my soon-to-be ex-wife. Life went fairly smoothly for a while after everything settled down. It took four long months, but eventually, the courts and the judge arrived at a fair decision, and we were granted a divorce. Actually, I was granted the divorce, as Betty initially refused to allow it, then tried to shift the blame onto me, and finally sought more financial support. Ours was a typical semi-contentious divorce, but I held on, and my lawyer turned out to be a good investment. Now, I was officially alone and single. I took the alone part pretty hard. I had a tough time sleeping. I was miserable at home. I soon realized that I needed to get rid of the house to find some peace of mind. I had ended up with the house in the divorce, so I put it on the market. I had tried for months to make living there work, but the place held too many memories, mostly the bad ones, so I knew it had to go. During the divorce, I discovered several things. For whatever reason, the lawyers had used the original appraisal instead of getting a new one. Betty was convinced that I would come back to her, so she told her lawyer to use the appraisal we already had, which was only three years old. Because of that, when the realtor came back with a new value, I found myself sitting on a house worth significantly more than I had anticipated. Another thing I found out was that my house was in a desirable area, 
sought after by almost everyone who knew it was on the market. By the time the realtor had listed the house, there were people lining up to see it. When it finally sold, six couples were bidding on it, and it became a competitive situation to secure my house. I ended up accepting an offer that was well above the assessed value. I soon moved to a new job across the country and settled into a comfortable, albeit lonely, existence. New place, new people, and a new job. It was all stressful yet relaxing at the same time. I didn't think about Betty too much, although I occasionally thought about Sue. There had been something there. I knew it, but I didn't know what it could have become. Let's hear from Betty's perspective. Here I am, newly divorced and alone. So terribly alone. My partner of the last few years has left me, and I'm trying to avoid ending up divorced and alone like him. Once I realized I had been caught, I cut all ties with Sam, but it was too little, too late. In effect, we both let go of each other, but in both cases, well, you know, I thought I could turn things around and return home to my husband, and in doing so, I discovered that the man I married had a strong backbone and withstood all my attempts to manipulate the situation. Looking back, I can clearly see that I messed up. I had the perfect husband, one that almost any woman would envy, and I tossed him aside for a bit of excitement on the side with Sam. He was thrilling for me, and I enjoyed the thrill of sneaking around on Jim. Had I been thinking clearly, I would have never made those choices. I got bored and acted out in a self-destructive way, like a drug habit or becoming an alcoholic, or any number of other harmful things people do to themselves. If I had the chance to do it all over again, I would never, in a million years, have cheated on Jim. Had I realized how hurt and angry I would have made him, I would have made different choices before straying from our marriage. Hindsight is twenty-twenty, as they say. I've been a foolish person. I spent several weeks reflecting on my actions and how I ended up in this situation. I can't pinpoint when I decided that it would be acceptable to betray Jim. I can't tell you why I did something so misguided. I wish I could take it all back. Now I am alone trying to figure out what my next step in life will be. I'm young enough to start over, but I really don't want that. I want him back. I want my life back. The life I had before I made those poor choices and ruined his respect for me. Was it worth it? Absolutely not. What I'm going through now is nowhere near worth the fleeting excitement I thought I was having. I sometimes worry that knowing what I did means no man will ever see me as a suitable partner again. They may be interested in me physically, but the qualities of a good partner feel forever lost to me. I messed up, and it's public knowledge that I didn't have my priorities straight. I don't have answers for why I acted the way I did. I know that I hurt my husband, the man I truly love the most, and that pain is now a part of my life. I can never return to that previous life except in my memories. I've already turned down several offers for dates and coffee from men who wanted to get to know me. I want nothing to do with anyone else with one exception, and I drove him away. You'd think a smart woman like me could tell the difference between being a supportive partner and making poor choices. No, I never strayed with anyone else but Sam. I met Sam under unusual circumstances, and we started seeing each other after having known each other for years. It just happened. Neither of us planned for it. Once it began, it felt thrilling and secretive, like a rush that became addictive. But then I was hit with the reality that Jim had discovered everything. That realization created a dark void that consumed me. My drive for connection, once vibrant, is now cold and uninviting. I haven't felt an urge for intimacy since Jim found out, well, that's not entirely true. I have wanted one man, the one I pushed away. My sister won't be around me much anymore. My parents are furious with me. Dad won't even talk to me. The worst part is seeing my sister working to win Jim over. She would be a better match for him, I admit. Susan has always known how to keep a man interested and engaged, making it less likely for either of them to stray. She's always been one for one relationship at a time, breaking it off for a long while before starting anew. I never understood that about her, but now I see I was blind to what it takes to be the right kind of partner. Don't get me wrong, I love my sister, and if she ended up with Jim, I would genuinely be happy for her, even while feeling the deep pain of losing him to her. I failed him completely. I am not the happy person I once was. I am not the person I was who made those mistakes. I've learned my lesson, but that lesson came too late for me, and the cost was high. 
I don't think I'll ever want another man. I lost the one I had because of another man's involvement. Jim sold our house, our home. I know that's my fault too, but it still hurts because he's moved across the country, away from me. I'm sure he will find someone else, and that hurts as well, knowing how kind and wonderful he is, someone I let slip away. That's it. I drove him away. I knew it for certain when he dropped off the check from the house sale. My share. He didn't have to do that, but he took the difference between the original appraisal and what he sold it for and gave me half, even after everything. As he handed me that check, the look in his eyes made me wish I could just disappear into the ground. Where there had once been love, there was only coldness, darkness, and anger. His eyes, which used to flash a deep blue, now seemed a light, icy blue filled with pain. Sam and I had been involved for just over two years when everything came crashing down. It all started at a barbecue one evening. Sam, being the new guy at work, was invited along with a few others. Jim had been called away just before Sam arrived, so I took over the cooking. That evening, we had friends from both my workplace and Jim's, and as the night wore on, the guests gradually left. Eventually, only Sam, a young couple, and I remained. After a while, the young couple departed, leaving just Sam and me. Throughout the night, I had felt increasingly drawn to him, even more so than usual at work. He was one of my co-workers from my department, and his ability to make me laugh had sparked something deep within me. By the time everyone else had left, my mind was racing with thoughts I was trying to suppress, particularly some of the more inappropriate ones. After we chatted and laughed for about another hour, Sam decided it was time to leave. Jim still hadn't returned, and I was feeling pleasantly buzzed from the beers I had enjoyed. I walked him to the door, where he thanked me for the invitation. I told him I was glad he had come. Suddenly, he leaned in to kiss me. It was meant to be a light, friendly peck, something that should have brushed my cheek, but I turned my head just in time, and his lips met mine instead. It was electric, sparks flew, and I felt a tingle spread throughout my entire being. I was acutely aware of the fear that Sam might sense my desire for him, and I managed to maintain my composure until he finally left. The warmth of his lips lingered with me well into the night. I knew he was married, just as I was. I was aware that what I felt in that moment was something a married woman, like me, shouldn't be experiencing with a man who wasn't her husband. Still, despite my mental resistance, I found myself wanting more. When we saw each other at work, Sam would always have a compliment ready, telling me how beautiful and attractive I was, joking with me more and more. With each passing interaction, my desire for something deeper grew, but I was unsure how to express my feelings. I didn't want to hurt Jim. I simply longed to recapture a sense of excitement that had faded from my life. Unknowingly, Sam had rekindled that flame inside me. Later that summer, we planned another barbecue, but once again, Jim was called away, this time before we even got started. I considered canceling it but managed to inform everyone except Sam. For some reason, I completely forgot to call him about the change until he knocked on our door. I was surprised, but I quickly realized I had invited him in without mentioning the canceled barbecue. It felt like a slip on my part, yet I pushed aside any guilt that began to surface as I enjoyed Sam's lighthearted jokes and easy banter. I also knew that his wife couldn't join us, as she had flown back to care for her mother after an operation. He said he would only stay for a short while, and we remained in the doorway of our home. I took his hand, guiding him inside, and as he followed, my heart began to race. I could feel a surge of emotions bubbling up inside me, and I knew that if Sam made a move, I would likely give in to my desires that night. Sam, perhaps unaware of just how much I wanted him, played his part perfectly. By the time things settled down, we found ourselves naked on the bed, having just shared an intimate experience. I even gave him oral pleasure in the living room, where anyone, including Jim, could have walked in and caught us. Lying there, exposed with Sam, the first pangs of guilt washed over me for betraying Jim. Sam must have sensed the shift in mood because he began to joke nervously. His attempts at humor quickly turned into a series of jokes and soon we were both laughing, the guilt dissipating with the sound of our shared amusement. After that night, the intensity of our connection only grew. We both realized that we had to take a step back to avoid getting caught, so we agreed to meet on specific days. 
At first, it was just once a month, but before long, it escalated to once a week. By the time Jim walked in on me, it had evolved into three times a week at my home, with stolen moments whenever we could manage them. This secret rendezvous had become an addictive thrill for both of us. We were fully aware of our commitments to our spouses, and we knew it was wrong. Yet the excitement and allure of what we were doing kept us entangled in this affair. I never suspected that Jim had caught on to my secret until I discovered him with my best friend. In that moment, I should have realized that something was off. Jim was not the type of man to stray easily. It wasn't until my sister revealed the truth that I understood why I had walked in on Jim and Shauna together. When I opened our bedroom door and saw her on top of my husband, my first thought was confusion. I wondered who was in our bed. Then I locked eyes with Jim, and the smug satisfaction on his face hit me like a punch to the gut. The anger welled up inside me as I processed that look of ownership, as if he knew all along. My heart sank as I realized that my husband was in bed with my best friend. How could he do this? How could I? It was a cold splash of reality, and it felt devastating to know that my spouse was unfaithful. The pain of betrayal crashed over me like a tidal wave and I felt a desperate need to escape. I had to run. I had to get out. I turned and left, knowing that if I started yelling or, worse, confronting them, all my secrets would come to light. At that moment, I wasn't ready to face the consequences of my actions. Once alone and able to think more clearly, it hit me that Jim must have found out about my affair, and that catching him with my best friend was his way of getting back at me. I realized that if I had hurt him half as much as I felt that night, I had truly destroyed our relationship. My next move was to resist the divorce and attempt to fix things between us. I suggested counseling and offered to do anything he wanted. He simply stared at me and then walked away. I tried everything I could, but with my parents criticizing me and my sister trying to influence Jim, I began to realize I had made too many mistakes to salvage our marriage. Seeing Jim and Shauna together in bed, the smiles on their faces when I walked in, filled me with anger. I knew I had no right to be angry, but he was my husband. My thinking was tangled. Here I was, a woman who had cheated on her husband, feeling betrayed by him. In my twisted mindset and feeling abandoned, I even thought about hurting Jim financially, but that didn't go as planned. His lawyer was known as the best in the state for divorce cases while the only lawyer I could afford seemed unprofessional. As a result, I didn't fare well in the divorce proceedings. To my surprise, Jim did relent a bit, offering me some financial support that I never thought I'd receive. He didn't leave me destitute, although I felt I deserved it. Now I find myself in a run-down apartment with noisy neighbors on a not-so-safe street. My job was almost taken from me, but Shauna, of all people, managed to help me keep it. I wanted to hate her, but she had acted according to her feelings. Once she realized that I had essentially given Jim up, her guilt seemed to fade. We don't talk or hang out, but she did stand up for me to help me keep my job. I suppose she felt a bit sorry for me because my actions mirrored her own precarious situation. Some might call Shauna a free spirit, but I often overheard men speaking about her in less flattering terms. I guess that was true, and now I find myself lumped into that category too. I'm not fooling myself. If I hadn't been caught, I likely would still be seeing Sam. Now that I've faced the consequences, I feel the weight of my mistakes. Each day when I wake up alone, I'm reminded that I should never have allowed myself to cross that line in the first place. I have no excuse. I'm an adult woman, and I should have resisted the temptation. I can't even place blame on Sam because I initiated the affair. I often think back to that day when I came home, ready to shower for my meeting with Sam, only to find him in bed with Shauna. The pain I felt was overwhelming. I wanted to scream at Jim, lash out at Shauna, and berate them both. Yet in that moment of anger, I realized I had been doing the same thing to Jim. Ashamed, I simply left. At that point, I had no idea that Jim already knew about my affair with Sam. If I had known, I might have begged him to forgive me, just as I would have forgiven him for his time with Shauna. But that wasn't meant to be, and I highly doubted it would have worked out anyway. Once Jim decided on a course of action, he was resolute. I never considered the possibility of getting caught or how much my actions would hurt him. I didn't think about what I was risking until it was too late and I had lost everything. 
This dark chapter in my life has been a life-changing and educational experience. I now understand the pain of having someone you love deeply betray you. I know what it feels like to lose sight of what truly matters and have to rebuild your life afterward. During the divorce, I uncovered things about Jim that I had never known. Like how he had been sending money to someone throughout our marriage. My lawyer dug deep, revealing that Jim could have hurt both me and Sam in a moment of rage. The revelation that Jim had boxed in the past and had nearly killed someone in a fight was shocking. I had never heard him mention it before. I was also surprised to learn that he had been supporting the very man I was involved with. The longer the divorce dragged on, the more I realized Jim's strength. What Sam and I had done for our own selfish reasons ultimately came back to haunt us. Jim had arranged for everything he had on Sam and me to go to Sam's wife. His divorce was much uglier than mine. I also discovered that this was not Sam's first experience with infidelity. He had cheated on his wife with other women even while he was involved with me. I couldn't imagine the hurt his wife must have felt when she found out. My own guilt didn't lessen in this situation, though. I had always had the choice to say no, and I failed to uphold my vows. A simple no could have changed everything, yet I chose to ignore that voice inside me. Talking with Billy's parents opened my eyes to the kind of man I had married. Jim's actions after that fight had been a reflection of his character. Surprisingly, Billy wasn't a small man by any means. Yet Jim had managed to inflict serious harm. Billy's parents spoke highly of him, and Billy himself referred to Jim as his best friend. As Jim's wife of seven years, I had never known about the other acts of kindness he had performed for many people, which my lawyer uncovered during the investigation. At one point, my lawyer remarked that someone as respected and kind as Jim would be difficult to find dirt on. That turned out to be true. The only scandal involving him was his affair with Shauna, which seemed to be orchestrated by him to help me understand the pain of betrayal. Now, having experienced what it feels like to be cheated on, I know how deeply it can hurt. The emotional fallout is devastating. It tears your heart apart and leaves you feeling utterly crushed. I am certain I will never betray someone again. I only wish I had realized this before, that I had listened to that little voice in my head after that first kiss on my doorstep so long ago. Story 2. How can you love one person and sleep with another? How is that even possible, and do you believe in it? My wife and I were fine. Children, home, stable job. My wife did not give me any reason to worry. The only thing we had problems with was our sex life. And only after more than 20 years did I realize what was really the matter. On a Friday, I had to drive across town to deliver urgent files from my precinct to police headquarters. I'd been desk-bound for the past two weeks due to a shooting incident involving my partner and me. The shooting was justified. We confronted a suspect who aimed a gun at us, and it was actually Jim who fired the shot, not me. Nonetheless, both of us were confined to desk duty until the Internal Affairs Division completed their investigation. Thoroughly bored with little else to occupy my time, I decided to detour by my house on the way. Helen had prepared a delicious brisket for dinner the previous night, and I thought I'd turn some of the leftovers into a sandwich for lunch. It was only a short deviation from my route, and I knew nobody at the precinct would be concerned about the time I took to complete my errand. As I drove slowly along my street, I parked my car across from Mrs. Ferguson's house to admire her beautiful flower garden. She dedicated eight months of the year to tending to it, and it was always a sight to behold. Just as I was preparing to continue the final 50 yards to my own house, I looked up and was surprised to see a man exiting my front door. It was Mark Malak, a resident from around the corner known as some sort of computer expert who worked remotely. I couldn't help but wonder what he was doing leaving my house at 11.30 in the morning. I observed as he casually strolled around the corner and disappeared from view. Then I parked in front of my house and went inside. The house was silent, but I thought I heard the sound of a shower running upstairs. As I ascended the stairs and entered my bedroom, I received an unpleasant surprise. The bed was in ruins. Pillows, sheets, and blankets were scattered on it, and there was a large wet spot in the center. There was clearly someone sweating heavily in the room which left no doubt about what Mark Malak was doing in my house. From the bathroom, the sound of the shower running reached me, accompanied by Helen's cheerful singing, a familiar sign of her contentment. Damn it, anger surged within me, 
poised to drown out my profound disbelief. Was my wife engaging in an affair with some neighbor behind my back? Helen and I had been married for 24 years, and I believed our marriage was quite content. We first crossed paths when I was still attending the police academy. She was assisting with catering at my cousin's wedding, and she immediately caught my eye as the most adorable girl I had ever seen. She was petite, charmingly attractive, not stunningly beautiful, but with an amazing physique. Through some flirting, I managed to obtain her phone number, and after about a year of dating, we tied the knot. For the most part, our marriage had been wonderful. I was employed by the department while Helen pursued her career in catering, often taking on freelance projects for a company owned by a high school friend. This arrangement allowed her to have a flexible schedule, enabling her to be an involved mother to our two daughters, Linda and Veronica. Linda had since graduated from college and was working in Chicago, while Veronica was a junior at Kenyon. They were exceptional kids, and Helen had been an outstanding mother to them. Helen and I shared a deep bond. Our values aligned, our family priorities matched, and we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. When we encountered other couples who seemed disinterested in each other, we exchanged knowing smiles. We were still having a blast together after two decades, never running out of conversation topics. I felt incredibly fortunate, except for one aspect, our sex life. Helen was undeniably attractive and had a captivating charm. I will always remember the thrill with which I first saw her body after several months of dating. However, she just wasn't prone to sexual intimacy. After our courtship and the first months of marriage, I soon realized with disappointment that Helen was content with intimacy only once every 10 days or so. This was in stark contrast to the three to four times a week frequency with which we started our marriage, and I did not hesitate to express my displeasure. Over the years, we faced this problem more often than any other. For a while, we even sought help from a family psychologist, especially when our daughters were young. After many years of disappointment and unhappiness, I finally realized that my wife truly loves me. Her lack of interest in sexual intimacy with me was not personal. It was simply due to a low interest in it. The counselor helped me deal with my anger and helped Helen realize the need for additional efforts on her part. Thus, what was once a frequency of once every 10 days evolved to perhaps once a week, occasionally twice if I could persuade her. I held on to hope that as our daughters departed for college and we gained more free time, no longer shuttling them to various activities like voice lessons, tennis practice, dances, or friends' houses, our situation might improve. However, this hope was never fulfilled. It became an even more difficult task. Our intimacy turned into a depressingly quick meeting. I dreamed of tenderness and affection. However, most of the time, she resisted my advances. She would say, as if defending herself, Not today, honey. Can we just do it quickly? I didn't understand at all what was wrong. Don't women usually want more foreplay? Just imagine the disappointment when you can't properly enjoy your wife for three months. You may be tempted to judge her harshly by thinking, Why stay with a person who doesn't meet your needs? But the truth is that Helen and I have a deep love and mutual appreciation. Despite her lack of sexual enthusiasm, she shows her affection for me in countless ways every day. We imagine a future in which we will grow old together. It's just that our sex life is not an important aspect of our relationship, and over time, thanks to my own efforts, I've found ways to deal with it. That's why when I staggered down the stairs and out the front door, I was both shocked and furious. I knew that Helen loved me, and I trusted her completely, knowing that she wasn't interested enough in intimacy to cheat on me. So, what the hell was going on? It took me less than three minutes to get to Mark Malak's house and ring his doorbell. When he opened the door a crack and looked at me uncertainly, saying, Hi Rob, what are you? I pushed the door hard, causing him to fall to the floor. Closing the door behind me, I grabbed him and hit him with my knee, causing him to double over in pain. When I picked him up again, I was pleased to see his pale, frightened face. He couldn't even speak. Holding him by the collar with my left hand, I struck him several times. In conclusion, I delivered a final crushing blow. I threw Mark onto the couch in the living room, watching him try to get some air, and gently hugged him around the neck. Listen carefully, you worthless person. I know exactly where you were and what you were doing this morning, and I'm on edge. I have a gun and a shovel. 
He was silent, just looking at me with fear in his eyes. Now you're going to tell me everything I want to know, answer all my questions, then you'll clean yourself up and get on with your life. And you will never, under any circumstances, talk to Helen again. Do you understand me? I squeezed his neck slightly to get his attention, and he nodded frantically. Yes, yes, Rob, I understand, he whispered, completely intimidated. After releasing him, I invited him to start talking. I made it clear to him that it was better for him to tell everything, not hiding anything and not downplaying his actions. He confessed everything. He and Helen had been in a sexual relationship for more than two months. Surprisingly, he claimed that she was the initiator of this. During a neighborhood meeting on July 4th, she openly flirted with him. When they were alone a few days later, she called him in the morning and asked him to help move the filing cabinet. When he arrived, she met him in just a bathrobe, expressing her gratitude. She kissed him passionately at the door, hugged him tightly, and touched him. Before he could voice his concerns, they were in our bedroom. I was amazed by his revelations. Helen was full of enthusiasm and looked forward to every meeting with him. Mark claimed that he repeatedly asked her, Are you sure this is all right? What about Rob? I can't confirm if this is true, but he insisted that she assured him that she would be able to keep it a secret from me. Since their first meeting, they have met several times a week, either at my place or at Mark's. This morning, he said, when I went to her house, she met me at the door. We went upstairs, and it happened again. Listening to Mark's story, I could only sit back, not believing my ears. The woman I believed I had been married to for 24 years bore no resemblance to the woman who had been enthusiastically dating Mark since the summer. One last inquiry, then you can attend to your mess. I can't fathom you being the first man she's fooled around with in this manner. Did she disclose anything about others? Without hesitation, he was completely broken by now. She hinted that there were a few before me, but she only mentioned one, Joe something, Oberman or older man. He's a firefighter. She said he ended things because his wife was becoming suspicious. Joe Olderman? He and Stephanie had been close friends of ours since our daughters were five. That despicable jerk. Both Helen and I were fortunate that I had the afternoon to compose myself and regain control. Helen's luck lay in the fact that I could have harmed her, while mine was in avoiding a lengthy prison sentence. By the time I returned home for dinner, I had managed to contain my anger. Helen remained cheerful and affectionate as usual. We enjoyed a delightful meal, discussing mundane topics such as the children's well-being, upcoming catering events for her, and the monotony of my desk job. Remarkably, I was able to mask my simmering fury behind a facade of normalcy. Later, as she lay in bed watching a rerun of CSI, I joined her. Naturally, the bedroom had been restored to its pristine state, fresh sheets and all. I leaned over to kiss her cheek, slipping my hand under her nightgown to caress her thigh. She cast a cautious glance at me and replied, Not tonight, darling, all right? I'm feeling a bit exhausted. How about we just relax and watch some TV together? Normally, this would prompt me to retreat, maybe with a hint of disappointment, but not tonight. I persisted, gently moving my hand upwards and insisted, No, I really need you tonight, honey, come on you'll enjoy it. Rob, she uttered, sounding irritated. I really want to, but I'm exhausted. It's only 9.30. You can't be that tired. She looked at me and said, I don't want to. While maintaining eye contact with her, I softly suggested, what if you imagine I'm Mark Malak? Her body tensed slightly in surprise, an unexpected, oh, escaping her lips as she stared at me wide-eyed. It was a look I'd never seen on her face during our entire time together. As a result, she agreed to intimacy without words, and I give my word, we have never had this before. After that, I got out of bed without saying a word to Helen, or even looking back. I headed for the shower. When I came out 15 minutes later, drying my hair with a towel, Helen was sitting up in bed again. She had made the bed, put on her nightgown again, and combed her hair. I could tell she had been crying. She looked at me sadly. Rob, I'm so. She started with a wavering voice, but I interrupted her. Let me speak first, Helen. I paused for a moment, staring at her icily. I went to the house earlier today, just before lunch, and I saw Mark Malik leaving. 
Then I came upstairs and heard you in the shower and noticed the state of our bedroom. So, spare me any excuses or attempts to deceive me, okay? Her head hung low, a blush creeping across her cheeks. She nodded silently. I'm not sure if our marriage can weather this storm. She gasped, her eyes widening in horror. But if there's any chance, it starts with you being completely honest with me. Do you understand? Helen nodded again, tears welling up. I'm so sorry, Rob. I can't believe I've done something so terrible. She paused, overcome by sobs. All I ask is for you to give me one more chance. I'll tell you everything, but please don't hate me. Fine, then. The whole truth about you and that guy. What happened? Where? When? How long and why? She sobbed for a while longer, then wiped away her tears. I never really noticed him until the July 4th picnic. Suddenly he was always there, bringing me drinks or hot dogs, being overly friendly. A few times when you weren't around, he would start flirting, stare at me, and even touch my back with a hint. But that was a few months ago, and I completely forgot about it until last week. He called and asked if he could come and help with a recipe he was preparing for his new girlfriend. So he came, and we worked on the recipe together. I explained something to him, and he was very grateful. We had a cup of coffee, and then I felt strange. Before I knew it, he carried me upstairs to the bedroom, you know. She paused, tears streaming down her face again. I felt disoriented. I couldn't figure out why this was happening, or why he didn't stop when I said no. He's a real monster. After he finished, he confessed that he had put something in the coffee and showed me his digital camera. He took a picture of us, Rob, the two of us, and he threatened that I should keep seeing him. Otherwise, he would make sure that you and all your friends at the station got copies of these photos. Rob, I was so confused that I didn't know what to do. I listened impassively, though internally skeptical. It seemed likely she was weaving a web of lies, but I decided to hear her out nonetheless. Unbeknownst to her, I had already conversed with Mark. He phoned last week, stating he'd return today at 10.30 a.m., insisting I prepare for his arrival. I was petrified about the incriminating photos, so I allowed it. I mean, he showed up, and we repeated what happened. I exhaled heavily. Helen, why didn't you inform me after the initial incident? Do you not realize we could have tested your blood and had him prosecuted for assault? She cast her eyes downward. I see that now. I suppose I wasn't thinking clearly. I was just terrified of your reaction, both towards me and him. Oh, Rob, I was so scared and so lost. Tears streamed down her face. I'm truly sorry, darling. A fanciful narrative. I mused silently. Implausible, yet not entirely implausible if one could entertain the notion that Mark Malak would be foolish enough to assault a police officer's spouse. Yet the account he provided during our confrontation seemed more credible despite contradicting my perception of my wife. Then there was the most damning evidence of all. The sound of Helen cheerfully singing in the shower mere minutes after Malak allegedly coerced her into another encounter. I pondered further, staring out the window while Helen sniffled and wiped her eyes. You've acted foolishly, Helen. After 25 years together, I expected more trust from you. She glanced at me sheepishly, repeating, I'm so sorry, Rob. I need some time to consider how to address this, perhaps a few days. During this period, refrain from speaking to Mark or anyone else about this. Understood? Okay, she agreed, suddenly hopeful. Please, Rob, don't do anything risky. Leaning forward, I studied her face. Helen, be honest with me now. Has this been the only instance of infidelity in our marriage? She attempted to meet my gaze, but her eyes flickered away momentarily. With my experience interrogating suspects, I knew what that meant. There's been no one else, darling. No one but you until, until Mark. Her tears flowed again, and she didn't finish the sentence. The blatant falsehood reignited my anger instantly. I rose from the bed and began pacing around the bedroom. In case it's not abundantly clear, my dear wife, I'm extremely displeased with you at the moment. You'll be sleeping in the guest room tonight, so gather your belongings and leave. Rob, did I not make myself clear? I interrupted with more intensity. I'm finished discussing this with you tonight. Now get out of here. But, darling, she broke off with a small gasp. 
hastily grabbed her bathrobe, and exited the bedroom. I settled back into bed to watch a football game for an hour before drifting off to sleep. I was surprised by how well I slept last night. Even though Helen wasn't beside me as usual, I suppose releasing some tension a couple of times might have helped. As I descended the stairs, the aroma of brewing coffee filled the air. Entering the kitchen, I discovered that Helen had gone all out for breakfast. There were pancakes, sausages, scrambled eggs, and even freshly squeezed orange juice. Helen stood at the counter, pouring my coffee, her expression appearing worn and fearful. Good morning, sweetie. She greeted me timidly, handing me the cup. Hello, Helen. I responded neutrally. This breakfast looks wonderful. We ate together, engaging in light conversation, and I observed Helen gradually easing her tension. Once I was satisfied, I pushed my chair back from the table and stood up. There was only one way to uncover the truth, and I wasted no time in pursuing it. Informing Helen that I needed some alone time, I swiftly made my way to my basement workshop before driving directly to Joe Olderman's house. As I pulled up, I noticed him walking towards his front door with the mail. I invited him to accompany me for a while to inspect the new car that I was going to purchase, and we set off, heading towards Forbes Avenue where the car dealerships were. I turned onto a quiet side street and pulled into a secluded parking lot behind the football field. Joe stared absently out the window. Suddenly, he turned to me, puzzled, and exclaimed, Rob, why are we here? What the hell is this? My service revolver was pointed six inches from his face. You despicable jerk. We've been friends for over 15 years, but that didn't stop you from betraying me with Helen, did it? His face paled, and he instinctively recoiled from me. Rob, I, I, who are you? I've never. Stop it, you idiot. I talked to Helen, and she told me the whole story. I'm so close to pulling the trigger that you'll disappear without a trace. He gave in. It was written all over his face in an instant. Realizing Helen had already spilled the beans, he saw no point in denying it. Instead, he scrambled to cover himself. Rob, I swear it wasn't my fault. She kept coming on to me over and over. I kept telling her we were just friends, that it wasn't right, but she wouldn't back off. I lowered the gun slightly, observing his deep breath and the sweat beating on his forehead. Fear filled his eyes. Tell me everything, slowly and carefully, and don't omit a single detail. If your story doesn't align perfectly with Helen's, I'll make your cheating look like an accident. He eagerly complied, desperate to avoid the consequences. His version mirrored Mark's. Helen had been the aggressor. With our families spending much time together, Helen had escalated their usual banter about a year ago. She began making physical advances even when others weren't looking. Eventually, she propositioned him over the phone. Despite initially rejecting her advances, or so he claimed, her persistence wore him down until he gave in. Rob, he began carefully, since you wanted to hear the whole story, I'm going to tell it. Just, uh, put the gun down, okay? I nodded, signaling him to continue. She was the most attractive woman I've ever dated. I've never had such intimacy as with her. How long has this been going on? I asked in a low and threatening tone. About eight months. We met once or twice a week. I was always afraid you'd find out about it. Then Stephanie began to suspect something, to act strangely, as if she somehow sensed that I was going astray. In the end, I convinced Helen that we should stop. It was last June. How did she react? She was annoyed, but she put up with it because she didn't want Stephanie to find out. She even made a joke, well, I guess I'll just have to find someone else to take your place. Joe, have you ever asked her why she cheated on me? Yes, many times, even before we started. I asked her, why do you want to do this? And what did she say? Nothing that really makes sense. Just that she loved you, that you were a great guy, but she needed something more. Do you think you were her first lover? No, she mentioned a couple of other guys she was in a relationship with. I didn't know any of them. I think she met one of them when she was serving a party or something. I leaned back and observed him. He averted his gaze, staring out the window. After a moment, I spoke up, saying, You really are despicable. You know that? I don't care how much she flirted with you. There was only one right thing to do, 
and you did the exact opposite. He lowered his head, avoiding eye contact. I suspected he was secretly relieved that I wasn't going to harm him. Our friendship is done, jerk. Get out of the car here. But it's at least ten miles to... His words trailed off when he saw the expression on my face. Quietly, he exited the car and walked a few paces away without another word. I turned the car around and headed back to town. I returned directly to Joe and Stephanie's place, fortunate to find Stephanie there. Hi, Rob. Weren't you with Joe just now? She inquired, peering past me to the vacant car. Yeah, but something came up. Listen, can we chat for a bit? Perplexed. She guided me to the kitchen, and we settled with cups of coffee. Steph, we've been friends for a long time, and there's no easy way to say this. Joe and Helen had an affair. What? She gaped at me, then shook her head. Rob, I might have believed you if you mentioned Joe and someone else. I had a suspicion last spring that something was going on, but Helen? No way. I retrieved the mini recorder from my shirt pocket, which I had discreetly placed before leaving the house. Without uttering another word, I rewound it and pressed play. We sat silently, listening together to my entire conversation with Joe. Several times, I felt like crying, and I knew the tears would come later, but I maintained my composure. I observed Steph as her expression hardened, her lips tightening into an angry frown. I surmised that her marriage with Joe was probably as over as mine was. After the tape ended, we sat in silence for a few moments. Then I inquired whether any of what we just heard made sense to her. Not really, Rob. For years, the four of us have simply been friends. You know we've always joked around a bit. There were a few instances I recall when you playfully pinched my butt or ogled my chest in a swimsuit, but it was all in good fun, and we all understood that. But this? Like I mentioned, Joe's behavior was suspicious enough last spring that it's believable he was cheating on me. But Helen? She's the last person I would have ever suspected him of being involved with. She gave me a suspicious look suddenly. Good grief, Rob. You didn't come here to make advances on me, did you? Some sort of revenge hookup, or what? For heaven's sake, Steph, I thought you knew me better than that. We've been friends for a long time. You know I care about you. Do you honestly think I'm that much of a jerk? She began to weep, expressing, I'm sorry, Rob. I suppose I'm a bit of a wreck at the moment not thinking straight. It's difficult right now to hold a favorable view of men, if you catch my drift. Please, Steph, remember that both you and I are the ones who have been wronged. You're undoubtedly a beautiful woman, and you know I'm drawn to you. But that's not the point here. I needed you to understand what kind of person your husband really is. I'm going to kick Helen's cheating behind out of my house, and if there's any way I can support you in dealing with Joe, I'm more than willing to do it. I wanted you to know the truth and to know that I'm on your side. That's the sole reason I'm here, believe me. Still in tears, she approached and sat on my lap right there in the kitchen. She wrapped her arms around me, rested her head on my shoulder, and cried. After a few minutes, we were both in tears. We probably stayed like that for half an hour. On the nearly six-hour journey to Chicago, I had ample time to reflect. The depth of Helen's betrayal was unfathomable to me. It was evident that she had engaged in numerous affairs, some of which she instigated herself. These clandestine liaisons had persisted for weeks, if not months. What hurt me the most, surpassing all other betrayals, was the shameless affair with these other men. Being with me, she experienced inhibitions, unwillingness to explore the world, and even refused intimacy. And for years, I silently endured this struggle. Nevertheless, she was discovered along with Mark, Joe, and undoubtedly others. As I departed Stephanie's house, my mind wrestled with two resolutions. Firstly, my marriage was irretrievably shattered, and Helen would soon regret her actions. Secondly, I needed to confide in my daughters first. Upon reaching Linda via cell phone, she welcomed my unexpected visit with joy. Over a meal at a nearby diner, she updated me on her new job and the fluctuations of her relationship with Chad. Then she confronted me, sensing my underlying tension. All right, Dad, spill it. I'm glad you're here, but there's clearly more to this visit than meets the eye. You've been on edge since you arrived, like you've had four cups of coffee too many this morning. I leaned in close and spoke softly, darling, 
I need to tell you something important before anyone else does. Your mother and I are separating. I've discovered that she's been unfaithful to me with multiple men for quite some time. The following hours were difficult. Linda struggled to believe me, and I had to convince her that I was certain about Helen's infidelity while also shielding her from the most hurtful details. Back at Linda's place, after she finally accepted the truth, she cried inconsolably. I shared in her pain. Realizing the shattered image of her parents' relationship was devastating for her. Tears flowed freely that day. I slept on Linda's couch, and before leaving the next morning, I made a request. Please don't confront your mom for a few days, or until she reaches out to you. I need to speak with Veronica today, and then begin the divorce process. After that, your relationship with her is up to you. Remember, your mom loves you dearly, and whatever she did, she did to me, not to you sweetheart. I arrived at Kenyon around 9 p.m. on Sunday, and my meeting with Veronica mirrored the one with Linda. It was painful, filled with tears and questions that couldn't be answered. I departed for home early Monday morning. Since I left the city, my mobile phone had been turned off. Now that I turned it on to tell the station chief that I had the day off, I found 11 messages from Helen. They ranged from tearful apologies to increasingly desperate pleas. After deleting them, I continued driving, thinking about how to get through the last chapter of our marriage. This situation has devastated me. The union I had put my whole heart into, which I had hoped to keep until the end of my days, has now broken up. It was in ruins, and for what? So that my wife could indulge in meetings, revealing a side of herself that she has never shared with me. I turned to a PBA lawyer I know for a divorce recommendation. When I arrived in the city, I immediately visited the office recommended by the lawyer. After an hour of discussion and the publication of Joe's record, I put the process into action. Since the girls were not at home, custody and alimony issues did not matter. My main concern was the house. If Helen disputes this, I decided to publicly shame her. Other than that, I wasn't much interested in it. At about 4 p.m., when I passed by the house, Helen's car was not there. Good, good, I thought. After parking in the garage, I arranged for a 24-hour locksmith service. By 6 p.m., when Helen returned, I had made some arrangements. I felt her disappointment and annoyance when she tried to open the front door with a key. I quietly opened it and noticed how the irritation on her face was replaced by a mix of tenderness and nervousness. Rob, thank God you're back. Where have you been for two days? I was so worried. Why didn't you call? She exclaimed and I waved away her question. Come inside, Helen. Please take a seat in the living room, I said calmly. When she tried to hug me, I pulled away and headed into the living room. Puzzled, she trailed after me. Rob, dear, what's going on? Her voice trembled slightly and her eyes reflected concern. Without answering, I motioned for her to sit on the sofa. Not taking my gaze off her, I studied the worried face of the woman who had held my heart for so many years. I let the silence drag on for a long time before I spoke. Helen, you know I would never lay a hand on you or do you any harm. You are a woman and once upon a time, I loved you very much. She exhaled. Rob, once upon a time? I don't understand. Shut up. I shouted, exploding and cutting her off. I may not physically harm you, but that doesn't mean I don't want to. So just shut your lying mouth and listen to me. Rob, I am. Shut up, Helen. I growled threateningly. I won't repeat myself. By this point, her complexion had paled with a mix of fear and anxiety. I could observe her hands trembling in her lap. We're going to have a discussion calmly and respectfully, I continued. And then you'll leave. I'm not concerned about where you'll go and frankly, I don't care. This marriage is over. Our life together is finished. She gasped, about to say something but a glance from me silenced her. You've been unfaithful to me with Mark, with Joe Olderman, and it seems with a couple of others as well. I don't know the extent, and frankly, I'm not interested. For months, possibly years, you've been engaging with other men. You've given them what I've pleaded for, done things with them that you refuse to do for your loving husband, despite my repeated requests. If betraying your spouse through infidelity is a measure, you've taken it to an extreme all acceptable for someone down the street and even for one of our closest and oldest friends. 
but not for the man who has dedicated himself exclusively to you for over 25 years. I genuinely don't recognize you anymore, Helen. I thought I did, but clearly, I was mistaken. I would have sworn on your faithfulness and loyalty with my life. It's fortunate I didn't, isn't it? I glanced at her, seeing her seated motionless on the couch, tears streaming down her cheeks. She had ceased attempting to speak, appearing entranced. I casually pondered what thoughts occupied her mind. Was it something like, oh no, he must have found out, or perhaps, it wasn't worth it in the end? Here's the crux of the matter that truly irks me. You love me. I'm aware of your love for me. We've envisioned growing old together, and I believe you were sincere. Well, guess what? That's your consequence. You don't get to grow old alongside me. You don't get to share a life with me anymore, to wake up beside me every day and cuddle with me at night. You don't even get to reside in this house any longer. I gestured towards three suitcases positioned in the corner. In five minutes, you'll be loading those into your car and driving away, Helen, and you won't be returning. She let out a cry, catching me off guard. No, Rob, please, baby, you? Yes, baby. I spat out harshly. I can and I will. I'm kicking you out, but first, a few minor details. I advanced towards her until I stood directly in front of her on the couch, looming over her. She recoiled in fear, watching me intently. I slid my wedding ring off and let it fall into her lap as her eyes widened in astonishment. I seized her left hand and removed her wedding and engagement rings. I dropped the wedding band into her lap as well, but I pocketed the engagement ring. The engagement ring belonged to my grandmother, as you're aware. That's staying with me. As for the wedding rings we exchanged, you're free to do whatever you damn well please with them. Melt them down, toss them away, or stick them wherever you like. They once symbolized our love and commitment, but we both understand their value now, don't we? I strode over to the coffee table and grabbed a stunning glass vase, mostly transparent but gleaming with vibrant blue and green hues. Remember this, Helen? It's from Venice, the fifth anniversary gift we gave each other. It cost a fortune, but we cherished it because it represented our bond. With a swift motion, I hurled the vase to the floor where it shattered into countless pieces, eliciting a cry of anguish from Helen. Not worth keeping anymore, I stated coldly, turning away. I grabbed two photo albums and flung them into the fireplace. Our wedding album and our family album. All those precious memories, all those reminders of what we meant to each other. But they serve no purpose now, do they, Helen? I bent down to pour lighter fluid on them, then ignited a match and watched as they went up in flames. Helen abruptly lunged towards the fireplace, attempting to halt me with a cry of, no. However, I swiftly encircled her waist and guided her back to the couch where she collapsed in tears. Together, we observed as the flames devoured the albums while I tenderly touched the pocket where I safeguarded the pictures of our daughters, rescued from the family book. My recollections of our girls remained invaluable to me. Within minutes, both books turned to ashes. Helen continued to sob, her face averted from mine. All right, Helen, that's enough. I interjected briskly, clapping my hands. The spectacle is over, and it's time for you to leave. Despite my words, she made no attempt to move. Taking her arm firmly, I urged her to her feet and guided her towards the front door. Wait, Rob, please wait, she pleaded, struggling against my grasp. You can't just kick me out like this. Actually, Helen, I can and I will. Her expression betrayed anguish and fear. Without even hearing me out, without giving me a chance to explain, I stepped back, studying her silently for a prolonged moment. Helen, do you honestly believe that anything you could say, any explanation you could offer, would alleviate my pain and betrayal? Is there anything that could make your infidelity, your utter betrayal and humiliation of me, more tolerable? Anything at all that could make this situation less agonizing or less dreadful. But I haven't even had the chance to explain why. Do you think I give a damn about why? I erupted. Will knowing why you did this bring me solace? All right, everything's fine now that I understand Helen's motivations. Are you delusional? She gazed at me, worn out, terrified, and distressed, wordless. Then, after a prolonged moment, she uttered, 
But what about the girls? I visited Linda and Ronnie over the weekend. They're aware of your infidelity and my decision to divorce you. Oh no, she exclaimed, collapsing onto the floor in tears. I observed her for a while. My cherished wife, the mother of my children, my life companion, my closest and most trusted friend for 25 years. Then I left her there, sprawled on the floor in the hallway, as I loaded her luggage into the car trunk. Upon returning inside, she sat there, vacant-eyed, staring into space silently. I helped her to her feet and guided her outside to the car. The car key rested on top of the car, and I positioned her by the driver's side door. I pondered appropriate parting words, but none came to mind. Goodbye, Helen, felt inadequate for the moment, and you cheating, felt cliche, so I simply departed. I re-entered the house and locked the door behind me. Standing there in the hallway, I didn't move, didn't really think. I waited to hear the sound of Helen's car driving away. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.